intolerant, most conservative communities in the country because all of the material on the internet is accessible in those communities. For example, what kind of material would be prohibited under this law? Well, how about the Supreme Court's decision in the Pacifica case, which, remember, uh, Justice Stevens attached to the opinion the transcript of the Carlin monologue, which is the very definition of indecent material. So that putting online the court's decision that includes that transcript would be a felony. Uh, another example that was used in the court was um, the play that won a Pulitzer Prize, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, a great play that contains lots of dirty words and some pretty graphic sex. Putting that online would be a felony. Um, all kinds of um, print articles by publishers that published on paper as well as online, like Wired Magazine, for example. You pick up a copy of Wired Magazine on paper, and it has, they don't mince words, they say shit and fuck, and there it is. But as soon as they press the button and put it online, they're felons under the CDA because they have made available, they display in a manner available to minors indecent material. Um, how about, um, of course, Jan Janet Jackson's breast and shares f bomb. Uh, how about you email your lippy little brother and call him one of George Carlin's names? That's a felony. Um, so you get a sense of the unbelievable scope uh, of this law. Uh, and the court went to the Supreme Court, and the opinion uh, was written by John Paul Stevens who wrote a charter of liberty for the internet. It's a wonderful decision. He redeemed himself, almost, from the mistake that he made in Pacifica uh, and wrote a great landmark opinion. One of the first things that he had to consider is what's the level of scrutiny that we should apply to the internet? Look, here's a brand new medium of communication. But this time, the court didn't botch it. It got it right. Justice Stevens dutifully cited Red Lion, which had quoted the soundtrack case. That is, that each medium of communication has its own unique uh, characteristics and the First Amendment rules that apply to the medium vary according to those statistics. That is, that's a rough paraphrase, um, but you know the idea. And, and the court said that's okay, let's look at what the characteristics of this medium are. The government argues in the Reno versus the ACLU case that the standard of scrutiny should be the same as in Red Lion. Very relaxed scrutiny. Give the government maximum leeway to regulate this medium. And they argued, indeed, that the indecency problem, as the government put it, was worse on the internet uh, than it was on broadcast. Why? Because the internet doesn't have the commercial sponsors, like broadcast does, that act basically as censors, that don't want to be associated with material that is indecent, and therefore sort of don't allow their um, broadcasters to put material that they don't want to be associated with on the air. Whereas in the internet, there's no such uh, censoring body of um, intermediaries, uh, and whoever puts up the stuff can deal direct with their audience. Well, Justice Stevens um, passed by that contention quickly and focused on comparing the characteristics of the internet with those of broadcast, pointing out that there's no scarcity problem here. This is not a spectrum scarcity situation at all. There's nothing to limit the ability of anybody to communicate on the internet. Um, there's no history of government regulation, no involvement of the government in allocating any part of the web to, um, to any business or individual. The medium is not invasive in the sense that broadcast was considered to be invasive in Pacifica uh, because you have to work at it a little bit. You don't get it in your car unbidden. You have to actually go find something, log on and go find something. Um, and Justice Stevens concluded that there is no reason to qualify the First Amendment protections on the internet leaving the internet at least as free as newspapers or as any medium of communication. I mean, it seems to me they're pretty good arguments that why the internet should be freer than any other medium. But if you take newspapers, for example, look at Miami Herald versus Tornillo and say, well, the court is extremely protective of that medium, it's at least as protective of the internet as it is of newspapers. So that's the scrutiny problem. Now look at the merits. What we have here, Justice Stevens says, is a content-based law that singles out obscene or indecent speech seen not being challenged, or patently offensive speech. That content-based, no question about that. Nobody argued that it wasn't. But under strict scrutiny, um, a content-based law is presumed to be unconstitutional with the burden on the government uh, to show compelling interest in narrow tailoring. The court, even Justice Stevens, in this great opinion, passed by the compelling interest point, didn't require the government to present any evidence of any kind, just basically assume that the government had a compelling interest in protecting America's children from exposure to sexual material on the internet. Taking, then taking the next step, that of narrow tailoring, that's where the court found the government showing wanting. Instead of giving the government the benefit of the doubt, the burden was on the government to show narrow tailoring, including that there's no less restrictive means than criminal prosecution under the CDA to serve its compelling interest. So they conclude not narrowly tailored. The law is overbroad in that, using some of the examples that I mentioned a little while ago, um, the law made, a criminal, made criminal a substantial amount of speech that is protected among adults. Indecent speech is protected among adults. We learned that in the Sable case, the, ca the uh, phone sex case. Um, and they repeat that and cite the Sable case. It's protected among adults. And the government, Stephen said, may not reduce the adult population to only what is fit for children to see. The level of discourse cannot be limited to that suitable for a sandbox. Overbroad because it criminalizes a very substantial amount of speech that is protected among grown-ups. And second, the law is vague, given that it's a criminal law that accentuates the vagueness problem because 
you got to be real sure that what you're saying or putting online um, is not going to be considered indecent or patently offensive in some community. And the chilling effect is great when people have to guess at the meaning of the law that Congress has enacted. And sort of complicating the vagueness uh, or compounding the vagueness of the, of the law is the fact that in one provision of this, in section A, uh, the, um, you're talking about indecency, whereas in the next section you're talking about patently offensive, which may or may not be the definition of indecency, and what's the relationship between these two provisions? Um, indecent in one, patently offensive in another, and neither one defined. Um, so because of the vagueness, which vagueness is a concept that can be used in non-speech cases, not a generally First Amendment concept. I mean, if a criminal law is vague so that people don't know what's illegal, it can be condemned as a violation of due process. But in the speech context, First Amendment vagueness is especially uh, condemned by the court uh, because it's speech that's being chilled. Uh, well, the government wasn't quite through. They had a last-ditch Hail Mary argument, uh, desperate argument, that uh, said, look, we have not only uh, interest in protecting children, we have another uh, compelling interest, entirely separate, and that is in fostering the growth and usefulness of the Internet by ridding it of the nuisance of indecency. And the government argued, Janet Reno's underlings argued, that um, in order to make this medium useful, and that people will want to do it, they don't want to be uh, looking up something and encounter sexual material uh, out of the blue, in order to make it useful, uh, they ought to root out all the indecent material. So it's somewhat reminiscent of the rationale for regulating radio, that there was all this chaos and the government could bring order out of chaos and make the medium useful. Well, Justice Stevens deals with that at the back of his hand, saying, in our constitutional tradition, we presume that the governmental regulation of the content of speech is more likely to interfere with the free exchange of ideas than to encourage it. The interest in encouraging freedom of expression in a democratic society outweighs any theoretical but unproven benefit of censorship. So the CDA was consigned to oblivion, never took effect, never became uh, enforceable because of the immediate suit by the ACLU, uh, and was stopped in its tracks. Um, as I said, the obscenity provision was not challenged. So that's still out there. But Congress um, couldn't rest with uh, having been uh, so wounded by the court's decision in the CDA case, immediately went back to work and passed what I call son of CDA, a brand new law, COPA, the Child Online Protection Act of 1998, which attempted to patch up the constitutional deficiencies that Justice Stevens had flagged in the Reno case. Uh, and it amended the law, changed the law, they wrote a new law that was different in three respects from the CDA. It was limited, that is the law's prohibition, uh, were limited to communications on the World Wide Web rather than the entire internet. Email, other non-web communications uh, were not covered by the law. Limited to sites on the World Wide Web, and the material had to be put online for commercial purposes, reminiscent of the phone sex law. However, commercial purposes could cover a lot of things, including communications by nonprofits. Nonprofits, for example, in the HIV uh, community uh, who want to put up material that deals with safe sex, show people how to use condoms and so on. Uh, so nonprofits would be covered even for commercial purposes. And the third change from the Communications Decency Act was that the forbidden content was not vaguely and inconsistently defined. It was material that is harmful to minors. Uh, and what the Congress did in the COPA decision, I mean the COPA law, was tack on four minors to each of the three elements of the obscenity definition. So harmful to minors means it appeals to the prurient interest for minors, that it is patently offensive under community standards, blah, 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 for minors, and lacks serious literary, artistic, scientific, political value for minors. It's a parody of the uh, obscenity definition, but it's now harmful to minors, which um, is illegal. Well, the law um, was immediately challenged, once again, by the ACLU and a bunch of nonprofits and individuals uh, who engage in online communication. Uh, the case was challenged immediately. They sought a preliminary injunction against the enforcement of the law, again, suing the Attorney General of the United States to prevent um, any prosecution. So that's what we'll start with on Tuesday. I will certainly have your um, graded and evaluated papers back on Tuesday. I'll post scores probably not until Sunday night or Monday, but I'm uh, sorry it takes so long, but this is a lot of work. Anyway, see you Tuesday.